My name's Donald Hunter. I'm from the Emerging Tech team in uh, Red Hat. Um, my colleague Sanjeev couldn't unfortunately make it for personal reasons, so I'll take this one on my own. And so let's get started. The, this is uh, eBPF 201, and the goal of this talk really is just to, um, well, assume that everybody knows what eBPF is, so we're not going to do the eBPF 101, but we're going to provide some uh, guidelines, I guess, for how to get started in, in larger project development with uh, BPF. And really the goal here is to target people that are not kernel developers, people like yourselves in the room who are uh, Kubernetes developers primarily, I guess, and uh, maybe somewhat unfamiliar with some of the uh, Linux kernel development practices. So we're slightly past the BPF 101, as I said, um, and we're going to focus on how we might tackle writing maintainable, portable programs that can be installed into the kernel. And this is kind of based on our experiences of learning as newbies as we went along. So hopefully what I present here will be helpful to anybody that's um, starting on a BPF programming journey. So just before I get started, can I get a show of hands of people that know what BPF is? Okay, most of you, that's good. And a show of hands of people that um, have actually programmed some BPF code. Yep, a considerably smaller number. That's, to, I guess, to be expected. Um, has, have people installed BPF programs and used them for observability in their clusters? Yep, a reasonable number. Okay, so that kind of level sets what the uh, audience expectations might be from the, from the talk. Okay, so I'm going to recap a little bit on BPF. Uh, not right from the beginnings, but just modern BPF as it stands today. Give you an overview of what I think are the kind of applications that can benefit from uh, using BPF. I'll give you a bit of an overview of the technology and uh, the, t the tools available in modern BPF. And then for the second half of the presentation, go through some what I would call, describe development best practices. Um, and then at the end of that, we'll talk about a few Kubernetes specifics. Okay, so just a technology introduction first. So BPF is, if it, for anybody that's not familiar with it, it's a sandbox virtual machine environment inside the Linux kernel, um, which has a verifier that t checks whether or not your program will safely run to completion inside the kernel without causing any hiccups. So if your program doesn't pass the verifier, it doesn't even get installed into the kernel. If your program does pass the verifier, then it can be attached to one of many hooks inside the kernel to execute. And the familiar ones are the ones shown up in the top left-hand side, which is a, you probably can't see the details, but it's a, a network packet flow diagram. And there are various hook points in the network packet flow where uh, BPF programs can be attached. And traditional BPF was used for packet filtering to just actually just, you know, do packet dumps from the kernel. So all you were doing in BPF program was, uh, was matching packet headers and then dumping packets. But modern BPF programs are considerably more powerful and can be attached at various hook points. So Cilium, for example, is a uh, CNI that uses BPF hook points at most of the C group SKB hooks to uh, run code to accelerate the data plane for, uh, for Kubernetes networking. There are a whole bunch of other hook points. You've got K probes and U probes shown in the center here, and an example of a simple program being attached to a user space program to count uh, the number of times a, a function gets called and report on it. And then there are also many kernel trace points which are easily instrumentable with BPF programs as well. So most of the trace points and new probes and things like that are useful for observability, but there are other use cases that, that come to the fore as well, and I'll just uh, talk about them a little bit. Um, BPF programs have access to a set of helper functions in the kernel that let them do various things a set of maps for sharing data between different BPF programs and with uh, user space programs. And more modern BPF has access to kfuncs. And kfuncs are kind of a new development that's been enabled by a new feature within uh, the BPF subsystem called Cori, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And I would say that kfuncs supersede helpers. Helpers are kind of like the, the way things used to get done in BPF code, and kfuncs are the new way of doing things. So you'll see more kfuncs become available, but there's an essential set of BPF helpers that aren't going anywhere. They aren't going away. They aren't getting deprecated. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Okay, so from a use cases perspective, um, 
there's a number of things you can do. There's, there's the obvious things, which is observability. A lot of people in the room have used uh, BPF-based observability tools. Um, you can observe macro things and micro things. You can do very, very detailed instrumentation, or you can gather stats about application execution times and things like that. Um, the other obvious use case is extending the Linux networking stack. Uh, with, uh, with BPF programs, a la Cilium, and other um, uh, network acceleration tools. But there's a whole bunch of other potential use cases, such as uh, implementing uh, hotfixes and workarounds, or mitigating against external attacks. And we're not just talking about networking attacks, they may be API attacks, or you know, things that you're, you're protecting against uh, containers, or, or something like that, from, from being able to do to your kernel. And the interesting thing about all of these use cases is they can be applied at runtime. There's no kernel reboots. You install a program, and it starts executing as soon as you attach it. So you can, you can upgrade uh, your mitigations, your protections, your networking features without ever having to have a kernel reboot. So you can imagine, longer term, more kernel features are, might get developed as BPF programs because the management lifecycle, the day two operational uh, tools that you have available to you are much more flexible than with having to do kernel installs and system reboots. OK, so just where are we on the uh, technology maturity map? So it, our classic BPF back in what I'm calling phase zero was the early technology, which was only for doing packet filtering, for, uh, for doing TCP dump and that sort of thing. And then somewhat about maybe eight, 10 years ago, I can't remember exactly, um, BPF and uh, VM was extended to allow much larger programs and to be usable for many more things in the kernel. And those were the early days of BPF where the tool chain was very uh, weak. Uh, it, the verifier had, had lots of issues and bugs and developing BPF programs was generally quite hard and probably actually harder than like kernel development. We're now in the phase where we're in modern BPF as I would call it. And there are a lot of new tools which actually make the, the developer experience um, more pleasant. Um, and we're getting to the stage where BPF development is something that more than just people that are traditional con kernel developers can, can truly embark on. There's no reason why anybody that's a, a developer in this room can't think about starting to develop BPF programs as part of, as part of their application development process. Um, modern BPF is built on some foundations, which I'll go through in a moment. Um, but just uh, listing them off here, BTF, which is the BPF type format, and a technology called CORE, which stands for Compile Once Run Anywhere. Um, and so we're really getting to the point where there's new innovations happening to make the uh, user experience better, and there's more richness and features being made available to BPF programs. We're getting to the point, and it's you know in, in the futures roadmap where you'll be able to do dynamic memory allocation within the kernel. You'll be able to use uh, well. I think as of today, you're able to use spin locks and things like that for doing uh, lock con uh, protection around data structure uh, modification in the kernel. So the features available to you are getting incredibly powerful. Okay, so just from the top here. Modern BPFC, as I'm calling it. Um, it, it, it's like restricted C, but it's not hugely restricted anymore. Um, you get to do unbounded uh, for loops, for example. You get to call other functions in BPF. Um, it's also got some interesting extensions, which are enabled by uh, the BPF type format and Core, such as there are uh, macros for relocating. Uh, access to kernel data structures, so you can be portable across more than a single uh, kernel version. And um, the next one down here is uh, BTF, which is the BPF type format. And within every kernel now, going forwards from the 5.x five, five series and the, um, the 4.18 kernel that ships with RHEL 8, uh, the type information of the kernel is actually provided, supplied by the kernel. So you can use a command line tool such as BPF tool to interrogate the type information of the running kernel. And then when BPF programs adapt to the running kernel, so you've got complete portability across, uh, across kernel versions. So early BPF programs, you couldn't do this. You had to recompile your code for every single target kernel version. 
which really, really limited the uh, portability and, uh, and deployability of BPF programs. So modern BPF has stepped past that and gives you true flexibility. Um, the, the technology Cori, um, which is implemented in libbpf uh, in user space, takes a BPF program and relocates data structure accesses to the actual fields within a, within a kernel data structure. And I'll show you a, an example of that later, um, which means that you don't need to worry about mapping, uh, having the exact uh, kernel headers for the kernel you're going to target at deployment time. Gives you a bit more flexibility and uh, improves the, uh, the developer experience uh, considerably and the deployment and day two operations experience as well. And finally, the last technology piece that enables um, modern BPF is, uh, is libbpf, uh, which is the, the user space library that uh, provides all of the uh, program relocation, program deployment into the kernel, um, uh, and the user space uh, library functions for, for accessing BPF maps and, and other things about your BPF program. So, these four things together give us much better ergonomics, the uh, improved type safety, the improved portability, um, they reduce boilerplate, and they give us much, much better uh, developer tooling. Um, so to the point that there's good support for BPF programs in, in C, in Golang, in Rust, um, and I'll talk a little bit about those when, when I talk about uh, tool stacks that are, that are available to you. Um, it's fair to say that there are still quite a few rough edges. Um, the biggest issue is uh, verifier. Getting your program past the verifier is always a challenge. And the kind of error messages you get from the verifier are also a challenge. So there's a lot, there's a lot can still be uh, developed and improved from a developer UX perspective in getting programs that uh, give you feedback on why they are failing verifier checks and why they can't install into the kernel. Okay, so just a little bit about um, uh, API stability and what, uh, what, what, what you want to try and aim for from a, a BPF program perspective. For anybody that's not, a f not familiar with kernel development and maybe not familiar with the term the kernel U API, um, it might come as a surprise just how, um, how, how things change inside the kernel um, and yet outside the kernel everything is, uh, is fairly static. So from a, from a Kubernetes uh, background where you go through an alpha and beta uh, cycle before uh, making version 1.0 CRDs or, or resources um, and then deprecating the alphas and betas and so on, the, the, the kernel model's a bit different. The kernel external APIs, once they've been published once, they stay the same. They never get deprecated. They very, very rarely ever get uh, get get uh, marked as for end of life. Um, they, they are, they're maintained as is forever. Internally, everything changes. Well, not all the time, but you know, a developer, a kernel developer feels free to change in internal APIs at will. So if you're writing a BPF program that wants to access the kernel internally, then there's shifting APIs that you need to be aware of. But your external API is going to be the same. Uh, how, how, the, how the, the user space accesses your programs and accesses the kernel is unchanging. So what this means is that there's a set of things within the kernel that you probably want to rely on from a BPF program perspective because they are part of the, the, the user API that uh, you can guarantee you're not going to change. But new innovation within the kernel is going to happen with these things that are called kfunks. And kernel developers have said, we're not making these part of UAPI. These are going to be part of the unstable kernel interface, which seems a bit of a challenge because if they want us developers to write BPF programs that use these kfunks, but they're not giving any guarantees about their uh, stability, then we're basically being told, use an unstable interface, which none of us really want to do. So it will be an interesting a journey to see how this unfolds as kernel developers say kfunks are unstable and the consumer community wants them to be stable. But they're basically saying they will make the best effort to maintain things and if you shout loud enough and you're using things then they will be generally kept stable for you. 
Um, KFUNCs are basically the way into the kernel to access things, to modify things, uh, and, and get features. So, for example, the most recent features that were made available to BPF programs as KFUNCs is uh, connection tracking, in, in TCP connection tracking. So, if you want to uh, write networking features in BPF programs, then you can use the underlying contract subsystem from within the kernel. You don't have to write your own in BPF code, which is clearly a benefit. Okay, so going to step forward into um, the architecture of a running BPF program. Now, this is looking at things from the perspective of a C software stack, where uh, we're using libbpf, and more specifically, we're using a thing called BPF Skeleton. Um, and this is a set of tooling that uh, is built around libbpf and BPF tool on the command line, where um, I can write some BPF code, and then I can ask BPF tool to generate me a skeleton C program. And the bit skeleton C program has a set of utility functions to load my BPF program into the kernel to access any maps that my BPF program wants to use. So I essentially get the, the skeleton of the user space program I need to write with the BPF program embedded within the user space program. So at the top of the diagram, that's what you see. You see a user space application that is linked with libbpf that has a BPF program embedded inside it. App one BPF dot object is the BPF program. When my app runs, it uses libbpf to install the app into the kernel. And that's when the BPF, libbpf library uses the uh, kernel type information to relocate my program to match the data structure fields that exist in the running kernel. Um, so I can run, I can install the same program on a 5.2 kernel or a 5.14 kernel or a 6.3 kernel, and libbpf will relocate my program to whatever might have changed in the data structures within the kernel. The BPF subsystem in the kernel uh, provides various functions, including maps, and th these are things like hash maps, array maps, um, bloom filters, uh, least recently used maps, and things like that. My BPF program gets access to them, and the user space application gets access to them via libbpf. So my kernel program can, for example, in this example here, I've got a network data path at the bottom. My program is attached to uh, the TC ingress hook in the network data path, and I might just be doing some metrics counting in my program, and what my program registered at the TC hook does is just, as it sees packets, it can do some packet header inspection, decide what types of packets they are, and then right into these maps, I've counted another packet of a certain, uh, say it's a TCP packet destined for a specific port or something like that. And then the user space application can read the metrics from these maps and report it to Prometheus or wherever your reporting application is in user space. Um, so that, that's the kind of like the simplest example of a BPF program you could write. Um, if you're doing more packet processing, then specifically in the networking data path, hooks like the TC hook, you get access to the full packet and you can rewrite the packet on its way through. So you can change packet headers, you can change packet contents, you can encapsulate, you can decapsulate. Um, so you can actually build pieces of an entire networking stack. Now, it's important to say that the BPF program is run to completion event driven. So the, the hooks that I was describing on the previous diagram, the TC hooks or whatever the trace point hooks, um, trigger programs to run as if they're event driven. So if you want to build a more complex application, likely you're going to be triggering event driven pieces of BPF code at multiple points and the state of where the application is running is maintained in BPF maps. So you may have multiple pieces of BPF code at different hooks, all reading and writing from the same shared maps, which is their shared state. And the BPF programs, of course, get access to other kernel subsystems via either helpers that existed or KFUNCs that those subsystems expose. So that gives you a kind of fairly large overview of the architecture of a running uh, BPF program. So from a de team development model perspective, you want to enable more than one person to work on uh, 
on your BPF program. And you need to think about the kernel versions and uh, supportability uh, that you want to support. Um, I, I've got a diagram a little later on about the kind of challenges that you may have with kernel version support and wh how, how you want, might want to uh, baseline and how you might want to uh, uh, tackle portability uh, challenges that, that, that come, come along. But um, it's important to point out that containerization does not isolate you from the kernel version. So you're going to be using bare metal or a, or a VM to provide you with the kernel version against which you want to develop. Um, so if you've, got, if you've got teams with different dev systems, then you need to baseline across those. Um, you need to decide what your minimum kernel version you want to support is. You need to uh, think about um, what features that you need from those kernels and verify that the BPF data structures and all of the other things are available in the kernel releases you want to support. Um, so yeah, eliminating challenge, uh, dependencies on specific dev versions is, is key here. Okay, so just going through some more kind of specific uh, recommendations for, uh, for, B for BPF projects. Um, firstly, like I'm saying, plan for target platform versions. So the challenge here is that BPF development is a, is, has been a moving target for the last f uh, several years. So the types of uh, maps you have, the types of uh, BPF hooks you have, and the types of uh, support functions you have vary quite, wi quite widely across kernel releases. And of course, as, as development goes on, th th this is not going to uh, stabilize any time soon. So if, for example, you want to, uh, you want to support RHEL 8 and you want to support uh, you know, Amazon Linux for AWS or whatever, and you need to support um, multiple architectures, uh, and you, you need to think about, well, how, wh wh what's my base release? So is it a 418 kernel, which has had lots of things backported from the 5.x kernels? Uh, can I baseline on 514? You know, th those are the kind of questions you need to ask yourself. And if you need to support a very broad range of uh, Linux releases, then you've got to be ready for features not being present or the, the modern features not being present in all the kernel versions that you want to be able to support. And I'll, we'll touch a little bit about that uh, a, a, a little later on. Okay, so programming stack per perspective, you've actually got quite a, a lot of choice these days. For a long time, all you could do was program BPF in C um, and program your user space in C. It's fair to say that with libbpf, the richest uh, set of features is still probably provided for C, but libbpf has bindings to, to go with, um, with libbpf go and libbpf rs for Rust. But then there are also native platform libraries like Cilium eBPF, which has maybe not quite the full feature set that is provided by libbpf, but sufficient for, for many Kubernetes applications. And on the Rust side, there's a, a, a Rust native uh, library called Aya. And Aya um, lets you write user space and kernel space code, both in Rust, and makes it very easy to write an application that passes data between kernel space BPF program and, and user space. So for, for some developers, IA might be an excellent choice. But for, uh, for a lot of things, you may have no choice but to use libbpf, especially if you're using some of the more modern hooks and some of the more modern features that maybe haven't made it into the, uh, the, the native libraries. Um, from, a, from a Kubernetes perspective, I imagine a lot of people will want to use Cilium eBPF even if it only has a subset of the features. But of course, you could write, um, you could write uh, helper uh, programs alongside your Go code that are written in C and you, or written using libbpf Go uh, so that you can get uh, the full feature set of the libbpf library for program loading. And there are other alternatives coming, coming along as well, which we'll talk about a little later. Okay, so the, the next thing is, how do you use portable type definitions? So you may have heard people talk about um, using a BPF tool to export a VM Linux from the kernel and then doing everything developing against VM Linux. But of course, that means that you're exposing your application to the entire kernel uh, internal 
API surface, which is an unstable thing. So you, you could end up accidentally using things you don't plan to use. But also, it's fairly unwieldy. It's like several megabytes of header file. So instead, with Cori, you get to write your own version of kernel data structures with only the fields you need in them. And the example here is, in my program, I want to access the struct skbuff to get at the, uh, at the, um, the packet contents from a TC hook. And um, the only two fields I need from the struct are data and len. So I write a version of struct skbuff that just contains data and len. And when I install my BPF program, the libbpf relocates those two field offsets to match into the actual struct skbuff, which is huge. And the two fields are separated quite significantly in the data structure, and I don't need to care. When I access my code, I just use the right accessors, and everything works just fine. So I mentioned if, you've, if you have to support multiple kernel versions and the kernels don't always have the features you want, then there's a set of tools available to you to do uh, kernel version probing and feature probing. And you can do feature probing, probing all the way down to the individual struct field level if you need to. But the two examples I've given here are checking the kernel version from within your BPF program and checking whether a feature such as uh, uh, lightweight tunnels is available from within BPF as well. And so you can then start to enable features to enrich your program on more modern kernels, but then fall back to behaviors that maybe don't have those modern features on older kernels. And then from, from a Kubernetes perspective specifically, um, there are a number of operational challenges. First off is that BPF programs can only be installed if you've got cat BPF, and sometimes you need several other elevated privileges as well. And you don't really want to be giving too many containers full privileged access, because that's right, kind of defeating your, your security goals in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. It's also difficult to handle multiple BPF programs. Um, there, it's been mentioned in previous uh, conferences that, uh, for example, Cilium getting broken by Datadog, uh, or Datadog getting broken by Cilium, or whatever, because they're competing for the same, uh, same hook points within the kernel. And so that's a challenge, how to handle multiple BPF programs for different application purposes all running on top of the same kernel. Um, and then there's just visibility and debugging related problems where you don't know why something's working or not working the way you expect because you've got no visibility of what programs may be running within the kernel below your, uh, below your Kubernetes uh, deployment. So, I think it, th th this is where you can consider new BPF tools that are getting developed. There's a tool called BPFD that is uh, being developed by the emerging tech team at Red Hat, which aims to tackle some of these problems. And the way BPFD uh, approaches this is to say, well, we're going to be a system level daemon that installs BPF programs into the kernel on your behalf. And it's going to have a gRPC API so that you can, at, you, you can provide you know, an authenticated API endpoint uh, with which your, uh, your Kubernetes application can ask for an application to be installed or can interact with the BPF daemon to query data from maps from your BPF program. And uh, the goal is for BPFD is also to integrate well into Kubernetes and use the uh, Kubernetes uh, operational model, as you'd expect. So the first thing here is... Um, Packaging up BPF programs themselves uh, within OCI images so that you can use, you can install BPF programs into uh, Docker registries or container uh, image registries. Um, and you get the, uh, the versioning that comes with that. You get uh, the authentication and so on that you'd expect of, of, of registries for download. And then declaratively saying what programs you want installed in, in your Kubernetes cluster with um, uh, node selectors and attach point selectors and things like that. So you, you, you no longer need to programmatically have your programs loaded, which is great for observability programs and could be incredibly useful for, uh, for infrastructure programs such as networking programs as well. And how this looks from an operational perspective, your applications um, don't need elevated privileges. The only thing on each node in your cluster that needs elevated privileges would be the BPFD 
and BPFD is the only thing that would need to uh, make sys calls into the kernel and would need to access maps for which it might need uh, elevated privileges. And then all of the user space applications can interact with the, the daemon either declaratively uh, using the uh, BPF operator in, in Kubernetes or using the gRPC APIs provided by BPFD. Um, so th this is a uh, in-development uh, project at Red Hat, which I think um, we'd like more people to get involved with. And uh, I think it's going to uh, really um, enable more use cases for BPF in, uh, in Kubernetes clusters. So finally, just a, a quick recap on some of the things I've said in terms of best practices. So your goal when you're writing BPF programs is to um, have a clean, stable interface between your BPF program and user space and have a stable interface between your BPF program and the kernel as well. And so interfacing with the kernel, you're using the Core E technology uh, and you're writing a minimal API surface against the kernel, which the current which gets relocated to the running kernel and its data fields when you install. You use um, macros within your BPF program to ensure that uh, the kernel knows when you're making API accesses that need relocated. Um, and then with user space, the interesting challenge with BPF program is that you want to share some data structures between your kernel and user space. Um, so you need to be very, very careful that you use data types that uh, that that uh, can that, that you have header files for in user space and that have meaning in the kernel. And so typically that means that you can't use you must not use kernel internal types when you're writing something that's to be shared with user space. So you may be familiar with. Uh, some kernel internal types such as U16, U32. Well, there are versions of those that are available for, uh, for sharing with user space that are in the uh, system headers typically uh, when you've got the, uh, the kernel headers installed on your platform. And between, within your own BPF program, you've got strongly typed data, data sets to, to work with as well. Now, it's fair to say there's still a lot of tribal knowledge uh, in, uh, in BPF development, but there are a number of good links. Um, and I've, when you download the presentation after, after the talk, um, you'll, you'll be able to access all of these links to, to the documentation that's available. There's some tutorial documentation available in, uh, in eBPF Foundation. The kernel documentation is steadily getting more complete. And in fact, a good call to action is for anybody that is familiar with kernel development. Um, you can, uh, you can contribute to documenting BPF program types. Um, there are good man pages for uh, BPF helpers. To my knowledge, there are no man pages for any of the BPF kfunks yet. Um, and then there are good library docs for all of the user space libraries that you might want to use, libbpf, libxdp, aya, and psyllium ebpf. And then there are reference blogs for some of the stuff I've talked about uh, in the presentation today, such as BPF Core E, the BPF Core Reference Guide. Um, and then there are good examples to work with, such as LibBPF Bootstrap and, uh, and the uh, practical BPF examples repo that's uh, provided by the XDP project. But like I said, there's still a lot of tribal knowledge, so anybody that is an expert, please step up and help fill the gaps in the tribal knowledge and uh, make BPF on-ramp easier for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>